is Tara. I'm Pastor David's wife, and today I have the opportunity to bring you a really short word. We're doing things a little bit differently today. We are going to uh, teach on worship, because uh, when you water something, what happens to it? When you water a plant, it, it grows. And so when a church teaches on miracles and signs and wonders, that's what happens. When a church teaches on worship, that's what happens, right? And we want a balanced, healthy diet, right? And so the reason we want to teach on worship is because worship is a learned language. It doesn't come to us naturally. The day we ask Jesus into our hearts, it doesn't come to us naturally. We have to learn it, just like you learn French. How many of you have learned a new language before? How many of you have been scared? You know all the language parts and the grammar, but you're scared to open your mouth, right? There's a risk you take. And so worship is a language. And I'm just going to ask the intercessors here today, how many of you consider yourself as prayer warriors? Put your hand up straight. How many of you love to pray? I want you to pray while I'm preaching, while I'm teaching. I need your prayer. We need to tear down strongholds, distraction, and we want to see God come. Amen. And so let's just quiet our hearts, and I I promise you I won't speak for long. I want to get out of the way so God can have center stage. So, holy God, we just thank you that you love us. Thank you that your eyes are upon us. That you delight in us even though we're broken and we're not perfect. And we mess up, Lord, you love us. So, Spirit of God, we just invite you to come, still our hearts. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So, in the true style of a teacher, because I can't do without PowerPoint presentations, you guys good with that? Because I'm a teacher, right? Um, I'm going to just put up a few quick slides. Hopefully they're quick. All right, so the first one is what is worship? So I went to the thesaurus and I looked at it. And in the thesaurus, it's got all these different words for worship. Adoration, devotion, adulation, awe, offering, applause. How many of you have been to a rider game? What happens when they do a touchdown? The whole stadium goes, whoa! What is that? It's applause for something great that was done right? What is worship? It's also praise, devotion, reverence, serving someone because they are amazing, right? How many of you have children? How many of you encourage your children and you say, wow, you're really good at that, right? You don't hold back your praise from your children because you know praise does something. It's good for you and it's good for them. But you know, biblical worship is actually not, it's not a process that goes from us to God, It's actually a gift that God gave us. He he gave us the tool of worship. And so if you look at it, worship is a gift from the Father to us. Now, does God need our praise? Is he an egomaniac? Does he need us to tell him he's awesome? Not really. He's God. He's perfectly satisfied in who he is. He doesn't have a self-esteem problem. Yet he created this process for us because it is a strategy by which we stop thinking about ourselves and our smallness and we focus on the bigness of God. We stop focusing on the problem and we focus on the problem solver. Amen? Can I hear some amens? I'm going to ask you to be free today. Shake yourselves. The minute you feel like you're going, Pastor Tara is going, you shake yourself and go, amen. All right? Because it's a discipline. Listening is a discipline. Writing notes. How many of you have seen me take notes? Is it because I don't know? Pastor David has preached his messages over. I've been married to him for 23 years. I've heard all his messages three, four times over. But I still take notes. Why? Because I'm leaky and I need to stay focused. So I'm encouraging you. Let's become a church that's students. Bring a notebook. Bring your Bible. Bring a pen. Let's take notes. Okay, let's stay on top. So if any of you says amen real loud, I'm going to know that you were sleeping. And that's okay, because we're family. Turn to someone and say, we're family. Now, this is not a performance, right? We're family. When we bought this church, I was, going to, I was telling Pastor David, we should have a stage in the center and throw some couches around. 
have coffee tables so we can be a family and worship as a family. Wouldn't that be intimate? Right? But we can still choose that, right? We can be a family. So let's move to the next one. These, um, these quotes really get me. A.W. Tozer is a very famous um, theologian from the past. He says, I can safely say on the authority of all that is revealed in the word of God that any man or woman on this earth who is bored and turned off worship is not ready for heaven. How many of you want to go to heaven? Heaven, you need stamina. You need stamina, and stamina comes from practice. If you're an athlete, you know that you need to practice in order to have longevity. If you want to run hard, you want to fight hard. So we need to be able to stir up ourselves to be disciplined. And President Calvin Coolidge, who was the US president many years ago, says it's only when men and women begin to worship that they begin to grow. How many of you want to grow in the Lord? Amen, right? I don't want to be a baby in diapers when I see Jesus. I want to be mature, eating the word, right? Meat, not milk. I want to be somebody he can count on, a pillar in the church, carry some burdens, do some hard things. I don't want to be a whiny baby that needs to be cuddled and comforted. I want to be like, warrior, I'm here. I know what to do. You don't have to tell me, right? Moving on, let's go to the next one. All right, reasons we worship. We worship because of who he is, primarily. We don't worship because we need something from him. He is so all-powerful and amazing. How many of you have been to the Rocky Mountains? What happens when you get to see them? Everything shuts down. You're in awe of the grandeur of the Rocky Mountains. And if you multiply that a thousand billion times, the word says his voice is like mighty rushing waters. If you take the Niagara Falls and you multiply it a million times, that's the sound of God's voice. That's an awe-striking thing. We're going to read some scripture because I believe scripture is important. Let's look at the Bible. Let's open up our Bibles. The first scripture is Revelations 1, 12 to 15. We want to know from scripture who this God is. It says, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like wool, like snow, his eyes like a flame of fire, his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in the furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. I want you to use your imagination. Close your eyes and imagine that. Somebody with a golden sash. His feet are shining. His face is glowing. And when he speaks, you can't even stand. Right? You need, you need to have a vision of who God is. And God. the Bible tells us who he is over and over and over. It's the same picture. Over the course of thousands of years when the Bible was written, people saw the same picture when they went to heaven. Let's, so Revelation was at the end. There's another chapter in Revelations 19. Let's do that. Oh, sorry. The verses are 11 to 16. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diamonds. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. That's you and me, guys. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, which strikes down the nations. And he rules them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fury. This is God Almighty Jesus, warrior. Scary picture, if you think about it. Let's go back to Daniel, which was written hundreds of years before Revelation. Daniel 7, verse 9. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days... I'll wait for Jimmy, you've got it? Ancient of Days took his seat, and his clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. That's an awe-striking picture. You just think about that. 
Okay. Revelations 4, 3. And he who sat had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Close your eyes and think about all of these images and pictures that God is giving us as a jigsaw puzzle to what happens in the throne room. It's powerful. It's so powerful. Let's go to Ezekiel 1, 26 to 28. And above the expanse over the heads was the likeness of a throne in appearance like sapphire. Seated above the likeness of the throne was a likeness with a human experience, ex appearance. And upward from what, he, what had the appearance of his waist, I saw a gleaming metal like the appearance of fire. And downward had the appearance of his waist, I saw fire and there was brightness around him. So above his waist and below his waist was fire. Like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness. There was a rainbow around him again, same thing. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. When I saw it, I fell on my face. What are you guys going to do if Jesus walks into this room right now? What is your immediate response going to be? This Jesus. Any, any comments? He's here right now. He's here. He says, when two or three are gathered, I'm here in your midst. He says in Hebrews, I worship the Father in the midst of my brethren. I want you guys to tap into that. Because you're not just an intellectual being. You're a spiritual being first. And the Holy Spirit is here. The Spirit of Jesus is here. And he wants you to be free. Like you were in the Garden of Eden. What would you have looked like if you were in the Garden of Eden before sin came? God sees you like that, perfect, holy, without sin. Can you see yourself like that? You need to forgive yourself. Let it go, because God forgave you. Forgive yourself. Separate yourself from that junk. Okay, moving on. Why do we need to worship? Can we go back to the slide? Some of these things I'm saying I wasn't planning to say, but I know that the Holy Spirit wants to touch somebody here. And if I can even impact one person today, that's good. We've done what we have to do because of what he's done for us. That's the second one. So there's a really powerful scripture that I always go back to. I don't know if you all know, but I've had a really rough year with medical issues. And one thing I know that when I worship God with clenched teeth and pain in my heart, and my body aching, he's still the same God. He's still on his throne. Nothing shakes him, and something shifts, and there's wind under my wings, and I can step up, and I can say, no, God, I refuse. I stand, because I know the end from the beginning. So is there a war cry in this house today? Is there a cry from some of you guys to stir up your spirit and say, I know where you've been, Pastor Tara. I've been there. I've been broken. But I'm going to stand in the middle of all that mess and I'm going to look to God. Because that's where my deliverance is. I'm going to sit with him in heavenly places because that's where I belong. I don't belong here. And everything shifts. Everything shifts as soon as you step away from this to that. And that's what worship is. And so God gave it to us as a gift because he knew that we would hate ourselves. He knew that we would be caught in our own smallness. So that's a gift, okay? So, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Who can say this with me? Anybody know the scripture? Can we have it up there? Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is, let's say it together, all that is within me, bless his holy name. We've got to move faster. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who heals, who forgives all our iniquities and heals all our diseases. 
who redeems our life from destruction and crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies. Come on, raise your voice. Who satisfies your mouth with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. That's important when you're 50. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, praise God, not punished us according to our iniquities. For as heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed his transgressions from us. We can stop there. There is so much in just that one psalm about what God has done for us. Amen? Let's move on. The reasons why we worship, because of who he is, because of what he has done for us. Number three, it's because he commands us to worship, because he knows it's good for us. How many of you parents command your children to eat their vegetables? You command them. You're like, no dessert till you eat your vegetables, because we know it's good for them, right? It is to bless and to honor him because he's worthy, and it's because we love him. Now, this is a complicated one. How many of you have ever been in love? What do you do when you're in love? Suppose... One person's in Saskatchewan and the other one's in BC. What do you guys do? You pay for a long distance package. You put money out. What else do you do? You buy a ticket and you fly over. No cost is too expensive. What else do you do? Talk for hours, find out what he likes, find out where she loves to go for supper, what kind of color flowers. You, whatever it takes when you fall in love. And, and, the, and the sad thing in today's culture is that we are so distracted with social media that we don't know who God is and we're not actually in love with him. Uh, there's a very famous person that said, the tragedy of the American church or the modern church today is that everybody is in love with Jesus they don't know. They know nothing about Jesus and they say they love him. How can you love him if you don't know anything about him? We have to make it our business to get to know him, guys, because our spirit longs for it. Our spirit knows God, and it's dying, and it's thirsting, and it's saying, open your word. I want to know who God is. Tell me who Jesus is. Feed me. We can't be in love with someone we don't know. So here's my prayer. Almost every day I pray this, Lord, I don't know how to love you. Teach me to love you. Close your eyes and tell the Father. Tell the Holy Spirit. When you ask him for, for this, he gives it to you. Just take two minutes. Lord, we don't know how to love you. Teach us to love you. Help us to fall so crazy, obsessed in love with you that nothing and no one can stop us. That we will look crazy to the world because we are so obsessed with you. Lord, teach us to love you. Thank you that you answer us when we ask you. Because we ask you according to your will. In Jesus' name. So number six is so that we may draw near to him. And number seven is probably for me the reason why I am such a warrior in prayer. Is because the devil wants to shut me down. Who stops you from coming to church? Who stops you from praying out loud? Who stops you from not singing? Who stops you from being distracted on your phone? Who stops you from worship? You have an enemy, and he knows you. And you know what? He has seen Esther's exactly like Esther. He has seen girls like that for thousands of years, and he knows what buttons to push. He has seen Lorna's. He knows exactly the type of Lorna. He has seen Brother Monday, many Brother Mondays, and he knows from Brother Monday's life and his history what buttons to push to shut him down. We are not going to let him win, guys. How many warriors in the house today? We are not going to let that devil take us down. We're going to surprise him. We're going to surprise him. He's picked on the wrong person, right, Nadine? He picked on the wrong person. We're going to show him. And how can we show him other than because we're covered by the blood and the word? We have nothing in us to stand up against the devil except Jesus. And we're going to surprise him. 
you've got to have the resolve to do that. No more of this, I'm just going to sin a little because everybody sins a little. I'm just going to, oh, it's okay, then I'll ask God to forgive me. No, 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 we are going to be ruthless with that. We're going to stop, we're going to put to death anything that mocks Jesus in our lives. What mocks Jesus in your life? Is it an addiction? Is it a habit? Put it to death. There's no time. You don't have time to flirt with sin. And I'm speaking as one of you. Struggle every day. Right? But then I have to renew my mind. Go back to God. God, I can't help me. I'm broken. Help me. And he comes. And he lifts me up. Every day. Is everyone doing okay? Okay, seven ways to worship. We're going to actually do this. So I'm going to ask you guys to actually stand up. Come on. We're all going to do some practice. There are seven ways to worship. There are seven Hebrew words. One is barak, which is to kneel. How many of you can kneel right now? And I'm not, I'm not going to look at you. I don't care. But I'm just going to kneel before the Father because I'm practicing to position myself before the Father. I'm going to practice how to kneel. I'm going to win my wars on my knees. Amen? That's a good one. That's a good one, to bow down before the Father. Let's practice it as a church. Let's practice it, guys. Let's preach from our knees. We want to be a church that prays on our knees, knows our knees. Now, if your knees are bad, God knows. He understands. <laughs> all right? It's all good. You can sit up now. Halal is to boast. How many of you can boast about God? What are some things you can say? Shout it out. Shout it out. Let's go. Three, two, one. 30 seconds. Boast about God. Tell us who he is. God is amazing. God, you're all powerful, God. You deserve all the applause and the praise, holy God. You are worthy, worthy, worthy. God, you are the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. You are the ancient of days. You are the line of Judah, the God who roars within me. Who is like unto you, Lord? There is no one like you. We give you honor and praise. Come on. Applause. Worship him. Worship him. We don't need need music to worship him. We can worship him anywhere. Father, we thank you that nothing's going to hold our back our mouth, Lord God. It's your breath in my lungs that I will praise you with, God. Thank you that I don't need music to worship move me. I don't need emotion to move me. I am disciplined and I will worship you anyway. No matter what I go through, my body is in pain, I will worship you. Amen? Stir yourself. Learn the language. Take a risk. Step out. I don't care what kind of church you've been to or what kind of church you're coming to. This is the Bible. This is scripture. That's the next one. Shabbat, to shout out loud. We just did that, right? We clapped our hands. We just did that. Tehillah, to sing praises. Now, do I need music to sing? Lord, I give you my... I give you my soul. I live for you alone. moment I'm away, I have, have your way, have your way, there's something, view my heart, let's go, I give you my soul, I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way in me. Now, I want to ask you a question. How many of you were thinking about something else while the words were coming out of your mouth? Let's be honest. Let's be honest. We're family. I was thinking about moving on with the sermon. <laughs> you see the battle we're in? And the more we discipline ourselves, the easier it gets. Amen? It's a discipline. It's not going to come to us naturally. It's an intentional, purposeful. Worship is discipline. You have to control your mind. Take your thoughts captive to God. All right. What's the next one? Toda, extending hands. Let's practice that, guys. It's biblical. Extend your hands up. It's like saying, pick me up, Daddy. Pick me up. Pick me up, Daddy. I need your help. It's saying surrender. Oh, God, I give up. I give up. I give up. I can't do this no more. I, I, I just, my reputation is trashed. I have no, nothing, no claim to fame. God, would you please help me? See, that's worship. Then the last one is Zamar, to touch the strings. How many of you can beatbox? Let me hear it. 
How many of you can make music with your mouth? How many of you can play an instrument? Do it. Okay, have a seat. Have a seat. I'm not going to go very much further. We, we just want to spend a good 30 minutes to give you the opportunity to Toda, Yada, Zamar, Tahila, but what are the others? Come on. Barach. Halal, Shabbat, Tahila. We want to give you opportunity to practice these things, guys. We want to create a culture in this church where as soon as you enter, you don't wait for the band to move you. You step in. You don't need music to move you. David and I, we um, served a pastor in Bombay who was tone deaf. Horrible. He would sing, remember? I would play the piano and he would play the guitar. And the man, the pastor changed keys at least three times in the middle of a song. And the power of God was in the church because he was a worshiper. It messed with my head because I could, I was like mad. I was actually angry because I kept looking for the key that he's in and I would quit. And then we'd end up just clapping our hands and the power of God would go. Do we need music, guys? No, music is good, but we don't need music. When you come to church next time, be ready. No matter what you're going through, step up. Say, I'm ready to worship. I don't need anybody to convince me to worship. I'm ready because I'm a warrior. I know what to do. Shabak, I'm going to shout. Zamar, I'm going to play with my instruments. Yada, I'm going to put my hand up. It's just in the Bible, guys. This has nothing to do with what type of church you go to. You want to be Bible-based? Go to a Methodist church and lift your hand up. Go to a Baptist church and shout. It's biblical. Is that okay? Can you guys do that? Shake it up, because this is what's happening in heaven, guys. There is no Baptist church in heaven. It's just Jesus and you, and how much you love him. Okay? All right, we just move on. What happens when we worship? I just want to show you the benefits of this. We are aligned and positioned for blessing. Suddenly, instead of being here, we are sitting with Jesus in heaven. We are seated. Ephesians 6 says you are seated in heavenly places. Suddenly, your vision changes. You don't see mountains. You see tiny little Lego bricks. Everything changes. You get the perspective of an eagle. Your, your problems are not problems anymore because you serve such a big God. It's nothing. We are transformed. Our bodies are healed. Do you guys know that there is a secular research being done that people who sing regularly and people who listen to inspirational talks are healthier long run? Who did that? God did that. God made us as human beings to be people who sing, who give praise. How many, how many of you praise your children regularly? If you don't, start doing it now. It's worth more than money. Praise your children. It's the most powerful thing you can do for your child. Praise them. Encourage them. Say good things. We get to worship alongside Christ. Whoa! Jesus! I get to stand next to Jesus. You know, you know he's smiling at me right now because he loves me. Does he love you? Is he smiling at you right now? He is. He just absolutely loves you. He knows every crease in your face. He knows every hair. He knows every pimple and acne. He's looking at you going, oh, I love this kid. The Hebrew word for love is ahava. How many of you have had a puppy that you just want to squish the life out of this baby or this puppy? How many of you have that feeling of love? Well, I just want to, oh, I just love. This is God. He says, I so ahava love you that I gave my only son. That's the kind of love he has for us. It's real. We are transformed intellectually. We are transformed emotionally, spiritually. And as a body, we are transformed when we worship. God aligns us. There's blessing in worship. Because now you're speaking the language of God, not the language of death. How many of you know the language of death? We use it all the time. Wicked. This kills me. I'm dying of laughter. It's the language of death. Think about it. It snuck into our dead. <laughs> That's victory in me. Like when he loves something, he says, dead. Right? This is the language of death, and we have, we have embraced it. But what is God's language? When you worship, your mouth aligns. And as you speak, you become. 
all right? We are armed with weapons that tear down strongholds. I mean, you can look at these scriptures. We shift atmosphere because we become light carriers and we point to Jesus. How many of you want to be an arrow that points to Jesus wherever you go? Wherever you go, you're pointing to Jesus. No, no matter what you're doing, you're crazy. You're different. You're pointing to Jesus, right? You can't help it. People are like, what's, what's about you? There's something different about you today, right? We join the continuous ancient worship that's taking place in the spirit realm. Now, I want you to think of the globe. Worship started, I'm good, honey, just leave it on the floor. Worship started where? Where does the sun rise? Say BC. Let's say sunrise in BC. <laughs> that's so weird. Okay, worship started there two hours ago. It moves on. In the entire globe, there's worship rising as the sun rises. Think about it, guys. You and I, we are joining our voices to that massive anthem of praise that covers the globe every weekend. That's powerful. It creates. Sound creates. And we are part of that ancient practice. Something really important to think about. Moving on. Um, do you believe that God is the greatest thing you can experience in the whole world? Ask yourselves that. Because if you do, your worship will change. Is he the greatest thing you will ever experience in the whole world? You have to be convinced of that. Isn't it a comfort that you can worship a God you can't exaggerate? There's nothing I can say that I can exaggerate God. He's beyond my words. Let's move on. Worship gets us through the hardest times in our life because it shifts our focus from the problem to the problem solver. I'm going to get the worship team up. Here are some tips that I would give you as somebody who learned to worship from my pastor. I learned how to worship. She taught me. It was hard, right? But you have tips, just like you have tips to learn French and Spanish. Let's learn this language of praise. Get to know God. How do we get to know God? What's our primary resource to get to know God? Read your Bible. And you have no excuses because everybody has a smartphone. There's a hundred million versions of the entire 66 books on the... So Google it, Safari, do what you've got to do. Get the word in your head and then it goes in your heart. Okay, one scripture a day. How many of you can do one scripture a day? One scripture a day. How many of you can meditate on that? I, would, I want to see some, I want to see some react, like, commitments here, guys. How many of you can commit to one scripture a day? And if you skip a day, do two scriptures the next day. It's going to change you. I promise. All right? Get to know God. Get to know his character. Memorize his names. And we're going to do a little workshop there. I'm going to ask you guys to just play and lay down a pad of worship. Uh, just, I mean, pad of music. This is a big one. You know why we don't want to go to God? Is because we're guilty. How many of you have been there? You don't want to go to church because you're guilty. You messed up the night before. And you're like, I'm not worthy of God. He doesn't want me. I'm too dirty. Shut it down. Who's giving you those thoughts? God sees you and he says, you're perfect. You've already dealt with that sin. He's already dealt with it. He took it. Repent often. I will repent three or four times in a day. Because I feel gross and yucky. And I'm like, God, forgive me. Forgive me. Sing the Psalms. This is a good one, guys. You should take a picture of this. These are good tips. Sing the Psalms or sing in tongues. It comes with practice. It doesn't come automatically. God's not going to take your mouth and lift, move it. If How many of you speak in tongues? Tongues is ballistics, guys. It's weapons that you want when you go into war. How many of you want to go into war with a revolver or a machine gun? I want a machine gun. And that's what tongues is. So if you have questions about tongues, read your Bible. Ask Pastor David. It's a real thing. It's a gift from God. 
and it changes the way we worship it shifts something for me it makes everything sharper more focused I just speak in tongues I sing in tongues surround yourself with worship and worshipers okay could you just turn it down just a little bit now how many of you have secular music on your iPods your phones clean it up because you can't praise God and listen to praise on, in heaven and then listen to a sleazy terribly gross vulgar rap song and expect the Holy Spirit to be happy inside Your Holy Spirit's never gonna leave you he's gonna be inside of you what is he thinking when you're listening to those sleazy horrible songs about hurting women and money what does he feel most of the worship you rap songs today is about money and women shut it down it's gonna mock Jesus in your life be ruthless with it take it off of everything take it off stop it what about the shows we watch so many things that we could shut our doors to eye gates ear gates these are gates and we permit things and yet we want to worship God and we can't because there's just so much junk in us let's clear it up guys Let's create a highway for the Prince of Heaven. Let's open up the gates. Let's create a highway that swings wide the gates and say, God, there is no obstruction. I am clear. You are clear for landing. Hey, are you guys excited about this? Are you learning something? Are you learning what worship is? It's so important, guys, that we are in agreement and in unity that we understand and then surround yourself with worshipers. We're going to actually look at some names of God really quickly and we're going to worship him. Let's look at the first one. I love these names. I have memorized them. Let's look at this one. It's Elohim. That is the name of God. He is the great I am. The indescribable one. who was and is and will forever be. He is, what's the next one? Abba, Father, my daddy. No matter how powerful he is, I get to walk into his lap and sit and weep and cry and stroke his face. I'm his little girl. El Elyon, God Most High, the rock that is higher than I. It's the next one. He's El Roy, who is the God who sees every tear you've shed, every prayer you've prayed, every mess you've been. He sees it. He sees you. He sees you. He sees you. He sees you, he sees you, and he knows. Let's move on. El Shaddai, God Almighty. Let's move on. Yahweh, Jehovah Jireh, God who provides. It's Jehovah Nissi, God my banner. Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals me. Jehovah Sidkenu, the God of my righteousness. Let's move on. There are so many names of God. Jehovah Shalom, God my peace. Jehovah Nisi is the next one. And there is one at the end that I want you guys to stand up. And as a worship family, we're going to step out, okay? I want you guys not to worry. Let's dim the lights. And I, let's do the last one. I want you guys to stand up and just declare who he is. Just let's declare, come on. Because when you lift up the name of Jesus, men are gathered to him. Something shifts in this atmosphere. Something shifts in this neighborhood. Something shifts in this city. When you open your mouth, pick one. Start to say who he is. Come on, I want to hear you guys. I want to hear the church rise up. Be the church. Let's not do church. Let's be the church. Come on, open up your mouths, guys. Come on, team, use your mics. God, you are mediator. Elohim, Savior. 
master, Emmanuel, Jehovah. You are the great I am. You are the shepherd. You are faithful and true. You are almighty God. You are Jesus the Christ. You are everlasting father. You are the good, good father. You are deliverer. You are Elohim, the great God I am. You are magnificent. You are the rose of Sharon, the bright morning star. God, there is no God beside you. There is no king beside you. Who can compare to you, Lord God? Stir yourselves, guys. Come on. This is about stamina, remember? This is about stamina. Let's, ex let's, let's exercise our spiritual muscles. Let's get stronger. Let's build stamina to tell him who he is. And your spirit will stay. out of your chairs go to a place in the sanctuary where you and God can be alone I want you to step out of the chairs it's really important guys now, if you're sick or if you feel like you need to sit no problems take a position take a position physically take a position that will cause you to be disciplined in worshiping God because it comes with practice so step out of your chairs because the chairs they're just same old same old how many of you are satisfied with same old, same old? I am not satisfied with same old, same old. How many of you want to worship God a little bit more today? How many of you want to see His face today? Come on, guys, you've got to want it. You've got to want it. So I'm going to encourage you to come forward. Repent. Make your business with God. He's here. Spirit of God, we invite you to come. Amil, I just want you to stir up a song. Do something different, church, today. Step out of your comfort zone today. 